My name is Irene Dansky. The date is August 20th, 1996. We are in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. We are interviewing Liesel Joseph Loeb, and the language is English. Tell us your name, please. Liesel Joseph Loeb. Would you spell it for us? L-I-E-S-L, -E Joseph, J-O-S-E-P-H, Loeb, L-O-E-B. Okay. What was your name at birth? Liesel Joseph. Okay. Have you had any other names? During World War II, I dropped the Liesel and became Elizabeth. Any other nicknames or Hebrew or Yiddish names? Uh, my Hebrew name is Esther, Esther Bat Yosef. And your birthday? My birthday is June 17, 1928. And your age now? 68. And I do have another nickname. Uh, oh. My husband called me that, and my grandchildren call me that. It's Shatsi. Does it have any special meaning? Or yes, is it, an it means abbreviation? little treasure, but because my husband used to call me that, the grandchildren are continuing it. Okay. Can you tell us where you were born? I was born in a small city in West Germany in the Rhineland called Reit. It's spelled R-H-E-Y-D-T. Uh, during your childhood, who lived in your household? My mother, my father, and myself, and in my early childhood, also a nanny. Can you tell us a little bit about your father? Yes, my father married late in his life. He was 45 when he married. My mother was 26 when she married, or 27. And uh, uh, my father was my buddy. He was my friend. Uh, there was never any generation gap. He was my hero. He was a lawyer. He had a, a firm in, in our city. Uh, he represented uh, industrial concerns as well as uh, the usual thing lawyers do, such as divorce. Uh, one of the cases that really brought him to the attention of the public was like an abortion case with two doctors. And I think after that, his, his practice really began to flourish. He had a partner, and uh, he was very active uh, with B'nai B'rith. He was uh, politically a social democrat, which did not become very popular as time went on. And he was a wonderful, wonderful husband and father. What was your father's full name? Joseph Joseph. Joseph with an F and Joseph with a PH. Was he always an attorney? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, right before World War I, he sat uh, as a justice uh, in the courts in, I believe, in Cologne. And that actually uh, was the reason why, after the Nuremberg Laws stopped Jews from having uh, practicing their professions, he was eventually reinstated because he was already uh, in that uh, field before World War I. When, would, when did he start practicing law? I, I believe his, he was accepted to the bar in 1911. And when did he have to stop? 1938. And tell us the reason? Because he was a Jew. I found in our papers a letter uh, where he request that he be permitted to represent at least Jews only until the end of 1938, and that was denied. He, uh, the uh, order for him to, uh, to, decease, to cease practicing came right after Crystal Night, which was in November of 38, and uh, that, was, that was the end of that. What was your mother like? My mother came, was the youngest of three sisters. Uh, she, I think she was the most beautiful of the three. She was a, uh, a trained coloratura soprano singer, and she used to entertain in Jewish circles sometimes, singing with, uh, and play the guitar. And she, her father did not 
permit her to study. She wanted to study medicine or she wanted to study art and he just wanted her to stay home, look pretty and play the piano. So that's what she did. Uh, she, uh, uh, she enjoyed traveling and uh, basically uh, she had no particular career uh, of any kind. Uh, she, she got married at, uh, I think, in 19, they got married in 1927, so she was 26 years old. And uh, she ran a big household, and she was a wonderful wife to my father, and a very caring mother. And she was, in times of crises, uh, a Goliath, and then afterwards she'd break down. And there were many times when her strength was called upon in her lifetime. In your childhood, were there specific moments you can think of that that happened? Well, yes. Uh, uh, for instance, when I was six, I had a very difficult uh, uh, middle ear infection and a consequent operation, mastoid operation, and she stayed with me in the hospital for six weeks. She stayed with me in the same room, took care of me. Uh, I would say when things, things more seriously happened, uh, when political uh, situations changed. For instance, during Crystal Night, my mother and myself, a visitor and a, a young domestic were in our house and she kept her head and took us uh, to the apartment of tenants that we had in the house to, uh, to, to save us. Uh, my father was in jail at the time after after the house was destroyed, the next day she had the presence of mind to have pictures taken of the house. She boarded it up, and she took me uh, to friends who were Dutch nationals and where she felt I would be safe. Then she went back home to my hometown to try and get my father out of jail, and eventually she was able to accomplish that too by uh, meeting with a policeman who called her one night to meet her in some dark alley as he had news of my father. And even though she was scared, she went to meet him and uh, she gave the policeman money. She gave him medicine and fresh clothes for my father. And eventually through this uh, liaison, my father was released. And again, uh, in London, when we were in England, much further. Let's wait, let's wait on it and we'll do that okay. when we get to London. Okay. But she, she showed her strength numerous times. Mm -hmm. Never, never ever forgetting who she was. And that was one of the points that I admired her for so much, that let's, she was really an inspiration to me. Let's go back to before the war. Mm -hmm. And what was life like in well, your town? What was the, the town like? The, f the first 10 years, first of all, of my childhood were really very happy, uh, very secure. I was an only child and I knew I didn't have any problems of sibling rivalry. I knew I was loved. Uh, I enjoyed being wherever children were. Our town was actually also the birthplace of Joseph Goebbels, who became the propaganda minister in the Hitler regime. Uh, our town, everybody knew everybody else. Everybody knew my father, first of all, because he was had a well-known uh, law firm. I would say probably one of the most successful perhaps uh, raising envy on the part of some colleagues, especially non-Jewish colleagues. Mm -hmm. And um, life was good. We lived in a big house. I, had, uh, I went to a Jewish day school so that I did not suffer some of the um, early anti-Semitic uh, uh, situations that other children experienced who did not go to Jewish day schools and who were eventually thrown out of their schools. And, uh, and my playmates, naturally, were also from, the, from school, and uh, with the exception of neighborhood children who started to call me all kinds of names when I was four or five years old, uh, I didn't really uh, have too many negative experiences as a child. How big a town was right? Uh, at that time, approximately 70,000. We were very close to the uh, next town, um, <clears throat> which was Mönchengladbach. Uh, today, that's all one municipality. Uh, but at that time, these were separate towns with separate Jewish congregations and separate synagogues and so on. 
But uh, for instance, there was a Jewish athletic club that I belonged to, and I would travel once a week to München Gladbach uh, to, uh, to do athletic activities and meet other ch Jewish children. Uh, there was a Jewish community center there where that took place. Uh, I think it was a close-knit community, Jewish community specifically, but my father had also, in the beginning, uh, many uh, non-Jewish clients. So he was well known. Okay. Was he active uh, politically in the town? Well, as I said, he was a known social democrat. I'm not quite sure what these activities entailed, but it was a, a known fact, and he was on a blacklist uh, once the Nazis came into power. Uh, there was an event, uh, when, when Chamberlain came to Germany to, uh, before the Czechoslovakian takeover, uh, in case the conference would not have uh, resulted in supposed peace, uh, there was a, a blacklist of people who would have been hanged in the public square, and my father was on top of the list as a social democrat and a Jew. That's, this is what my mother told me. I, I really, uh, I think perhaps he wrote articles in, in periodicals, social democratic periodicals, but I really have no other knowledge of what his activities entailed. Did he Politically, that is. Did he know Goebbels? In yes, he account? did know Goebbels very well. When Goebbels first uh, graduated uh, university, he wanted to be a playwright. And he wrote a play which was declared a plagiarized uh, plot. And so he was discouraged and often didn't have uh, financial means for his next meal. And very often my father would uh, have him at his table. Uh, and uh, um, give, perhaps steer him into uh, a direction that would be uh, feasible for himself. Goebbels was a cripple, you know. He had a club foot. He was a very small stature. And uh, even though he was quite brilliant and a, a brilliant speaker, I think that uh, gave him some kind of a complex. And once the Nazis came to power, uh, they uh, took advantage of his mind and uh, he was able to uh, further himself in the party. That's, uh, that's, I think, how that happened, that he uh, became what he was. But uh, in his student and post-student uh, years, it was a whole different story. About when was that? Do you have any idea? The it must have been in the early 20s. Did, was there any contact with him later on? No, when, uh, no there was not. But uh, when my father, uh, here in Philadelphia, was translating editor for a German newspaper, which uh, appeared daily uh, here in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Gazette Democrat, and he wrote an open letter to Joseph Goebbels at that time. That was the only other uh, indication of the relationship. You said that there, you had a nanny yes. uh, in the household. Yes. You said that there. She was like was my second mother. What was she, her name? Her name was Otti uh, Hagedorn. And, uh, when, uh, well, actually, that, that was her married name. Her maiden name was Otti Reuter. And uh, her parents were like my grandparents. Uh, her father used to take me to ride on the carousel when it came around. And uh, her mother used to spoil me with all kinds of uh, knitted things that she made for me. I had a grandmother, but these two people were something like grandparents. and. Uh, uh, when I started school, uh, she she didn't no longer stay uh, stayed my my nanny, and uh, she got married just before I started school, and she insisted that I carry her veil in her church ve wedding. Uh, this was already during the Hitler time, and my mother felt that it might not be advisable both for her and for us, and she said, oh, she wouldn't get married in church unless I would carry her veil. So. I carried her veil. She used to come and see me afterwards. She didn't live in our town anymore. She moved to Essen with her husband. And uh, whenever she came home to visit her parents, she'd come and visit me. And um, the party 
uh, uh, asked her not to do that anymore, the Nazi party, and she told them she's going to do whatever she wants. And they said, well, could you visit them at nights? And she said, no, I'm going to visit whenever I want. And so she did. And uh, she probably lost track of us once we left Germany because not knowing what happened to the passengers of the St. Louis, uh, finally when the war was over, I wrote to the same address where I knew she lived before, and we resumed our relationship until she died. She came to see me in this country, and it was like before I was her kid. She used to call me the kid in German. Did you have much contact with your own grandparents? I only had a grandmother, and of course, my, my grandmother lived with my mother's oldest sister in, this, in her own house. It was my grandmother's house, and my mother's oldest sister uh, lived in the same house. It was a big house. It was in the next little town where my mother was actually born. And uh, my grandmother came usually every Saturday afternoon, and my mother would invite uh, some of her friends over for coffee. And sometimes she'd stay overnight, and sometimes she didn't. And later on, when my mother's oldest sister left Germany, my grandmother moved into our house, and she stayed with us. Uh, now, there was another sister who lived in Berlin. Um, she was a doctor, and my grandmother would visit there uh, occasionally for a period of maybe a couple of months, and then come back to us again uh, during crystal night, she happened to be in Berlin, and that saved her life because the Nazis came in through, the vandals came in through her room and ripped open the mattress with a knife in her room. So she was luckily at the time in Berlin. What was your grandmother's name? Her name was Matilda uh, Salmon, and her maiden name was Hyman. She came from Kaiserslautern. Do you want me to spell that? <laughs> sure. It's K-A-I-S-E-R-S-L-A-U-T-E-R-N. It's in, uh, I think it's, uh, it's southern Germany. And she was one of 12 children. And what, what were your aunt's names? Your My mother's sister? sisters, uh, Johanna was the oldest, and Elsa was the middle one, the doctor. And did they survive? No, they did not. Uh, Johanna and her husband, Ulrich, U-L-R-I-C-H, last name Heidelberger, H-E-I-D-E-L-B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E they emigrated to Holland. My, my uh, uncle uh, ran my grandfather's factory. My grandfather had a clothing factory, and my uncle took it over when my uh, grandfather died. And uh, he was warned that the Nazis were coming to confiscate the factory and the night before my uncle walked across the border into Holland. And later on my aunt followed. Unfortunately, they were caught by the invasion of the Nazis and they were sent to Sobibor and did not survive. They had one daughter, Ilse, and she came to this country alone in 1936 or seven. My mother's other sister lived in Berlin. Her husband was a musician. She had one child, Gunther, a boy, very gifted. And they had very high quota numbers. Uh, they never made it. Uh, uh, they were deported to the Lodge ghetto. And from there, I have documentation that they were deported further and there is and a word in the book that the Germans have published uh, regarding all the deportations from Germany, you know? And in that book is a word that says verschollen, and verschollen means disappeared. So that unfortunately we, we have no further knowledge of how they perished, but they perished. When did you leave Reich? We left in uh, May of 1939. Why? What, what? Why? Why? Well, it was past crystal night. My father, I think up until um, 1938, I think he thought that, so, like so many other uh, 
Jewish uh, intelligentsia that this folly could not last, that uh, it, 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 had to, it had to stop. I think he was, I don't know what convinced him, at what point he was convinced. I know it was before Crystal Night because of the correspondence I'm finding regarding our emigration. Uh, there was, for instance, the dismissal or the deportation of all aliens, Jewish aliens, out of Germany in approximately October of 1938 to no man's land between Germany and Poland. I don't know if it happened before that, but at one, some point, I think in 1938, he was convinced it was time to, to go. It was time to get out, and uh, uh, I've found all kinds of correspondence to that effect. Um, Where did you go? Well, <coughs> first of all, there was Kristallnacht, and uh, after Kristallnacht, I were, my mother took me to Bonn to friends uh, who were, were Dutch nationals and therefore the house was Dutch property and she felt I would be safe there. And through these friends, my parents met a Cuban family by the name of Stutzel, S-T-U-E-T-Z-E-L. He, he was German but a, a Cuban, had become a Cuban citizen and his wife was Cuban and through their efforts, uh, my parents uh, got these uh, emigration permits into Cuba. They were visiting Cuba and they heard about it that uh, the immigration official in Havana was issuing immigration permits. And uh, they, they bought them for my parents and brought them back. And so then the next step was to find a ways of leaving Germany. Meanwhile, our relatives in the United States who up until Crystal Night had felt my father was too old to emigrate into the United States, uh, considering his occupation and his age, had issued us uh, affidavits, which is a, a guarantee that they would uh, uh, support us in case it was necessary and so on. And all we needed now was somewhere to go and some way to get there. And the St. Louis was like a godsend when the Germans declared they were uh, preparing a ship that would leave for Cuba in May of 1939 and that it would be st uh, specifically for Jewish refugees who wanted to leave Germany. And so uh, my father uh, immediately got in touch with a travel agency and book passage and, uh, and that's how we came to be on the St. Louis. Tell us about the St. Louis, how you heard about the St. Louis just through? Uh, it, it, I, th I don't know how they heard about it. Uh, perhaps it was publicized in the paper or perhaps it was through these Cuban friends. I don't know how they heard about it, but uh, there it was, you know, and uh, the minute they heard, sometimes these things go by word of mouth when somebody hears about something like that because there were such few ships that took Jews all together. In, in my papers, for instance, I found out that most ships which left Germany in, at that time in history had only a limited amount of space that they reserved for Jews. So that even if you had all the necessary papers to leave, uh, finding a ship to take you, a means of getting out, was still a problem. And here was a ship that was uh, entirely for Jewish refugees, uh, so that was quite something. Of course, there was an ulterior motive for the Germans, and, and this motive really is one that we didn't find out until uh, the authors of the book Voyage of the Damned uh, found evidence that this was to be a, a, a trip for an espionage situation. And uh, the Germans figured, let the Jews pay for it. That was something none of us knew at the time. How did people ordinarily, how did Jews ordinarily go about getting affidavits, documentation, permission to leave the country? Well, there was, it was a very complicated matter to do this. First of all, the American consulates had been instructed, as we now know, 
not to make it too easy for people, for Jews to enter the United States. And since there were, uh, the uh, German quota for immigration into the States at that time was 25,000 per year, 25,000 people per year. And the government made no allowances uh, uh, borrowing from other quotas. That was it. And, and we now also have found out that those quotas were never even filled, even though at that time we didn't know it. There was such an onslaught for requests that then the consulates issued numbers, first come, first serve numbers, like in a delicatessen store. Uh, uh, this was never uh, an official announcement. It spread over Germany by word of mouth. I know my parents had friends, excuse me, with whom they got together regularly, who by a very casual conversation said, uh, well, uh, there is now a quota system. You, ha you have to get numbers in or before you can go to the consulate. Uh, our consulate was in Stuttgart. Uh, <clears throat> you have to apply for a number. And immediately my mother would call up her sister in Berlin and say, listen, you've got to get a number. My parents had a fairly low number. It was, I have the documentation. <clears throat> it was in the 14,000s. That was considered a low number. By the time her sister was able to get to a consulate and get a number, they were in the 70,000s. And that was like a uh, condemnation to death. And you could not, uh, you could not do anything without that number in so far as coming into the United States. Was that true for other countries too? Yes, my, uh, my parents had an affidavit by, uh, by the uh, b beginning of 1939 and they had visa and all they needed was the passage, the money to pay for it, and uh, they were going to wait for their quota number in another country. And that's what most of the passengers on the St. Louis were doing. They did not intend to stay in Cuba, but simply wait far away from Germany, outside of Germany, until their quota numbers would come up. of Lisa Loeb's interview. Lisa, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to your childhood in right to uh, bring up something. What was your religious life there? You said, you said that you went to the uh, Jewish, Jewish school. school. Yes, it was a one-room school because we only had about a hundred Jewish families living in right. As I said, the other city nearby, München Gladbach, had its own congregation, its own Jewish schools and that was a much larger city. Um, we had a teacher who was not an ordained rabbi, nor was he an uh, uh, official cantor. I would compare his title to a reverend. He conducted services, he conducted weddings and funerals, and visited the sick, and was the shepherd of his flock, so to speak, uh, of the congregation. Uh, the uh, persuasion was what we would call liberal, Com uh, comparative to conservatism here in the United States. However, uh, uh, women did sit separate from the men. The women they sat upstairs. The uh, children, both male and female, sat downstairs with the men. Boys on one side of the bima, girls on the other side, and the men in the rest of the, of the, uh, of the synagogue. Uh, because it was a Jewish day school, my father took me to services every Shabbat and, of course, all holidays, and my mother would come on all holidays. And um, sometimes when I talked too much, he would lead me out, and that was very embarrassing to me. <laughs> and I don't think it stopped me from talking. <laughs> Do you have the reverend, his name was Max Hyman. Uh, his wife used to teach embroidery as a uh, part of our curriculum. We already had embroidery in second grade. Uh, that was customary in Germany. I still have some of my productions, as a matter of fact. And um, 
he had two children, a son and a daughter, who were both older than myself. They were very nice children, and the only time I got very annoyed was on Simchat Torah, uh, when we had flags to carry around, and there, these flags had been made by the women of the congregation, and some of them were really beautiful. And always those two kids got the best flags because they lived right there. <laughs> the school and the teacher's home and the synagogue was in one complex. And so naturally they were there first and they always got the best flags. But they were really very nice children. Uh, their names were Edith and Walter. And the one other thing about them, uh, when I, when I came to write uh, the last days of my stay in Germany to say goodbye to my friends because I had been living in Bonn, I went to visit them also, and we were playing cards. And uh, Walter, the older of the two children, um, perhaps at that time he might have been already 13 or 14 years old, and I guess uh, his sister was 12. Uh, he said while he was, he showed me how to shuffle cards the way they do in a casino, you know, uh, the kind, you kind of flip them. And while he was doing that, he said, you know, Hitler said by 1941 there wouldn't be a Jew alive in Germany. Now I do those, I still flip the cards that way. And every time I do it, I think of him and what he said. Uh, when we were invited back to Germany in 1989 to write, uh, there was a, uh, a uh, display in the museum uh, of the history of the Jews of the area and their contribution to the area. And there was a picture of the teacher of Max Heimann. And the caption underneath read something like this, that uh, he had a chance with his family to emigrate out of Germany and that he chose to stay with his congregation that he was deported to the uh, I believe they were all deported to the uh, ghetto of Riga and from there uh, deported further and he and his family perished and I felt that that was a heroic thing and um, on the last day of our visit in Reit in 1989, I called attention to that fact, and I asked those present, both Jewish and otherwise, to, for a moment of silence, for the memory of this very brave man. Do you have memories of other uh, religious holiday celebrations of your, oh, your yeah. family and so yeah. on? Well, uh, Hanukkah and Purim were always times that we put on plays in this little schoolroom. Somebody built a stage and we rehearsed plays. Uh, you know, it, it was it was as much fun as you could have in a German school. You know, you didn't. I had a lot more fun in American schools than I did in European schools. But as much as much fun as you could have over there, we had it. As I said, we had we had plays and we had celebrations and we had a sukkah and uh, there were some private uh, people who had uh, a sukkah and so on and uh, I was particularly lucky because Hanukkah of course we celebrated in my house and then my father had some uh, Christian clients that weren't paying too well but they gave me lots of presents at Christmas time <laughs> so I had the best of both worlds. When you moved to Bonn, yes. what was life like there? Well, the people, our friends in Bonn, um, the friendship went back, first of all, to my father's college days. And uh, the, uh, the family name was Steinfeld, S-T-E-I-N-F-E-L-D. The Steinfeld family held lots of real estate in Bonn, and they also had a men's clothing store. The senior Mr. Steinfeld had an early death my father was not only his co friend from college, they were friends from college, from uh, university days, but he was also the legal representative of the business and of their, their um, holdings, so to speak. There was one daughter, Anita, and my father became her guardian when her father died. So it was a very close relationship, very close friendship. 
and uh, the widow of this Mr. Steinfeld was our guest at the time of uh, uh, Crystal Night, and she immediately said, "You'll you'll bring Liesel to my house in Bonn, and she'll be safe there." And that's what my mother did. So I came to Bonn, and this was a household of women. Mrs. Steinfeld had a maiden sister who lived there in the apartment. Her daughter at the time was living there. The son-in-law had already emigrated to Holland. He was a Dutch national, and the daughter soon followed. And uh, there were no kids there, you know, and the people weren't really used to a little girl anymore. They were wonderful to me. Uh, and, and also, the Jewish school in Bonn was still in session after Crystal Night, which was unusual. Probably the reason was because you, you didn't know it was a school when you went by there. The school was in some kind of a building that looked like an office building from the street. The playground wasn't visible, and there were Venetian blinds on the windows, and so the vandals didn't know. It, and it wasn't on the same uh, property, for instance, as the synagogue. So the school was not destroyed, and it was still in session. So I enrolled in the school, in the Jewish school, and I became friendly with the daughter of the cantor in Bonn, Cantor Winterberg, W-I-N-T-E-R-B-E-R-G. He had one daughter, and he, uh, he and his wife were so kind to me. They used to invite me on weekends, and they would treat me like their own child. And, and I was just a member of the family there, and I hung out there at least as much as I did with the people I was staying with because there was another child there. And to this day, we're friends, by the way. She only lives five minutes away from me, even though she went to Auschwitz. So we have a very long bonded friendship. Her name is now Annelie Nossbaum, and she's probably in your files as well. Uh, the, uh, the days in Bonn were quite tolerable. We went to school, we went on hikes. At one point, I had to have my tonsils clipped because of the uh, requirements of the American consulate for my emigration into the United States. And uh, my parents came to visit me. Once my father was out of jail again, my parents would come to visit me perhaps once a month or so. And uh, so I was able to, to see them. And, and I would, you know, everybody was very kind to me and all that. But still, it was my first time away from my home and from my parents. Uh, so, and, and the Winterberg family really understood that and, and my needs somehow or other. I could never forget that, how understanding they were in, uh, in treating me like their kid and, and being part of the family and having another child to play with and so on. Tell us a little bit about your father's visits to jail. Well, uh, on cr the day before Crystal Night occurred in our town on November 10th. Uh, I imagine that the reason for Crystal Night is not necessary here to uh, pursue. Uh, let it be said that ours was one of only two houses in the city that were vandalized. There were businesses that were van Jewish businesses that were vandalized, but private homes only two. Both were on our street. And um, who the vandals were, my mother never found out. However, we, we know that they were not locals. They were people from out of town. Um, we had a large house, about a 20-room house, and uh, we had tenants on the third floor, non-Jewish tenants. They took my mother, our visitor, our domestic help, which was also a Jewish girl, and me in, and they hid us. And the, the man went downstairs and told the vandals that they must stay on the first floor because he occupies the rest of the house. And they didn't know from anything else. There was enough for them to do down there. I was very frightened. And my mother tells me, told me that at one point I wanted to run downstairs and beg them to stop because the noise was so frightening. And my mother had a time to hold me back. I don't remember that, but she told me that. And of course, if my father had been 
in the house or they would have found him, uh, they would have uh, killed him. They, they were ready to kill him. Uh, the uh, the uh, Christian gentleman who lived in our house told them that my father was uh, not in the house, that he was not in town. And uh, they, the house looked in the morning when they left, they had, they had pulled, literally pulled the gas range out of the wall so that gas was leaking throughout the house. However, they also smashed all the windows, luckily, and nobody lit a cigarette. So we were lucky in that respect. Somebody stood guard in front of the house all night long. <clears throat> and when they finally left in the morning and we came downstairs, I've seen houses bombed out in London and it didn't look any different. There was, there was strewn about the legs of tables and chairs and uh, the shards of glass and china and books that had been torn apart, the piano that had been turned upside down and hacked to bits with an ax, eggs had been thrown into this mealy and, and, and food and you, you cannot imagine what it looked like. You cannot imagine. Uh, my mother had the house boarded up. She went to the police and reported the vandalism and the police said, well, why didn't you call us? Yes, of course. Uh, and uh, after she had that all done, we left and went to Bonn. Yeah, your father was not there. Where was they, he? On, on November 9th was my father's birthday. On November 9th, the <clears throat> attaché at the German embassy in Paris was shot and killed by this young, uh, young Jewish boy. And that precipitated the pogrom. It was just an excuse. They would have found another excuse. They came the day after, the morning of the 10th, the uh, black shirts came, they knocked on the door of our house, and uh, they came to arrest my father. They had uh, rounded up all the Jewish men that morning. Uh, they riffled through all kinds of papers, and they said, well, the B'nai B'rith, this was a, a subversive organization as far as they were concerned, and so on, and they, they dragged him off to jail. I think all the men in town were first brought to the local jail. Uh, from there, most of them were shipped to concentration camps, either Dachau, uh, I think for, for most of our area, it was Dachau, which was near Munich, not close by at all. However, my father was known at the jail because as an attorney, he often had clients in jail whom he visited. And so they kept him and they, they treated him kindly. Thank God. They kept them in jail. There were a handful of others as well, but most of the men and boys up to from age 14 on were shipped to concentration camps. Uh, eventually a policeman, as I had said before, called my mother and uh, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure how long he was in jail. It might have been as much as six weeks. He finally came out. My mother had begged him not to go to the house, but to come directly to the house where she was staying. She was staying with friends uh, in a, a, about a couple of blocks away from where we lived. But he did go to the house first, and I think he was just absolutely devastated with what he saw. And then he, uh, he came to my mother. And from then on, it was the only, the only thing was to get ready to get out of Germany. And when did your parents come to Bonn to stay? They didn't stay. They, didn't. they come for a visit, for come Saturdays, leave Sundays to okay. visit with me. Okay. Now, when did you leave on the, uh, for the St. Louis? Did you board uh, the St. Well, Louis? Well, the St. Louis was to sail on May 13th, 1939. Uh, so my parents had me come back to ride about a week, a week and a half earlier so I could say goodbye to my friends who were still there. Meanwhile, quite a few had left already. And, um, <clears throat> and so that we would then be together. And the plan was to uh, go to Berlin to say goodbye to my mother's sister and her family, my grandmother, who was then living in Berlin. She had, she had stayed in Berlin permanently after our house had been vandalized. And, uh, and that's what we did. We, uh, we took the train to Berlin and we uh, stayed in the house. I never saw the city 
We were there for about three days, and I have an autograph book in which everybody wrote, and whenever I want to cry, I look at that. And from there, we took the train to Hamburg. Uh, we, were, we arrived in Hamburg probably the day before embarkation on the 12th. And my mother's sister came with us. The other sister had already emigrated to Holland. She was no longer in Germany. And um, by the way, the, the Nazis were uh, agreeable that all those Orthodox Jews were allowed to uh, embark already on Fridays because of uh, the religious law of not being allowed to ride on Shabbat. If they were ensconced on the ship before Shabbat, that was okay, and they were allowed. We embarked on Saturdays. We stayed in a hotel, in a nice hotel, but we weren't allowed to eat in the dining room there. There was a sign, Jews, and Jews are not, Juden nicht erwünscht, which means Jews are not, uh, I wouldn't even say permitted, but we do not wish Jews to come here. So we ate somewhere else, and I remember we spent, uh, my father had a few marks left. We were allowed to take per person 10 marks with us. 10 marks translated uh, into dollars, I think about $4.50. Plus our clothes on our back, the, the steamer trunk, and uh, we had sent furniture to the United States as well as to Cuba, and that was it. And then I think they got some script so they could spend some money on board ship. And that was it. And I remember having a 50 finish piece in my pocket. And I gave it to the, 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 the guy who was uh, letting us through, the customs man, who, uh, who uh, kind of was supposed to examine us that we don't have smuggle anything. But he, he really was very kind. And I, I said, well, I have this 50 cent piece here. And he says, well, go buy yourself something. Uh, other people complained that they were mistreated by the customs people. We didn't have such a, an experience. And we, uh, we had a cabin right across from the purser. We traveled, for, there were two classes, first and second class. We started with first class and we had a cabin, just the three of us to ourselves. The St. Louis was a luxury liner and this was quite a revelation to a 10 year old, you know, and uh, that was an adventure for me. So we uh, embarked uh, and the ship left on Saturday, the 13th of May. And uh, the band played a song that they usually played when the crews left. You know, this is a cruise ship between New York and Havana. And they, and since it was a German ship, they always played this little song, little folk song, Must I Leave My Little Town. Wasn't the right thing to do. <laughs> Wasn't the right thing to do. So we left. How was life on my, my the My aunt stood on the, on the platform, and I, I, I was only a kid, but I had a feeling I wouldn't see her again. It was a luxury liner. You said you had a cabin. Was it a luxurious life while you were at yes, sea? Yes, it was. First of all, you know, in Germany, we already had ersatz coffee and ersatz white bread and ersatz this and ersatz that. Ersatz means um, substitute. Uh, for whatever reason, I mean, Hitler was arming for war. And uh, there were things that weren't available. But on the ship, they were available. Uh, the, the meals were sumptuous. I have a menu. Um, there was afternoon tea with dance. There were uh, the, uh, the uh, usual games that were played on board, such as shuffleboard and the horse races. And uh, there were people who played bridge, and there were movies, and most of all, my mother didn't sit on me. I, I roamed the ship for, I couldn't get lost, right? For they had, we had close to 300 children out of the 937 passengers, close to 300 children on board. And they had all kinds of entertainment for the children. 
so there was always something to do and there was a gym and I would go and, and uh, play around with the apparatus in the gym and I got friendly with the elevator man and I used to run the elevator and let him have a cigarette and I got friendly with the steward who rang the gong for meal times and he let me do that. I had, I had a great time on board. Meanwhile, they also were teaching Spanish and uh, I think after a few days, as the weather improved and we got into more tropical weather, everybody relaxed a whole lot. But the captain heard uh, news that uh, made him worry. He heard that the ship that was ahead of us had difficulties about uh, uh, unloading the passengers. The Cuban government was uh, making noises about not allowing the people to get off the ship. And so he decided that perhaps it would be, uh, as an, a German officer in a German uniform, he might intimidate his passengers. And so he decided to um, call a few of the men among the passengers together to form a committee as a liaison in case there's going to be a problem. This was a very a renaissance man. The captain was really a renaissance man. We learned much more about him when we had our 50th anniversary in, in Miami and his nephew came over to tell us about him. He was an artist, he was a poet, he was a writer, and he was a very smart man. He was small of stature, but he ran that ship with an iron hand and he had told his crew that the people whom they were going to serve on this trip were supposed to be treated like any other passengers that usually go on the, uh, our passengers on that liner. They were Jews, but they were to be treated with uh, respect just like any other passengers. How long did the trip take? I believe it took us uh, 10 days, 10 days to uh, reach Havana. We left perhaps a little longer, perhaps close to two weeks. I, I, have, the, I have the exact fingers. S uh, somewhere short of two weeks to reach Havana. And what happened at that point? Well, um, I remember it was early in the morning as we uh, saw land and came close to the port and we saw uh, the palm. My father woke me and we went up on deck and we saw the palm trees. I had never seen palm trees and the pastel colored houses along the shore and the capital of Havana, which looked a lot like our capital in Washington, D.C. And the harbor patrol came on board and passengers had been ordered to get their luggage ready the day before and they were handed all kinds of forms to fill out. I have some of them in my, uh, in my uh, collection and uh, everything was prepared to disembark in Havana, but then the order came uh, that the ship was not to enter the port, but to throw anchor about a mile or two out of the harbor. And everybody got very excited, and they kept asking the, the harbor patrol that was on board, uh, when can we get off? And they would say, manana. And that went on for a whole week. A whole week we were in the harbor and uh, after a while you know there were lots of families who already had somebody over here families where the father had already left for the United States and came down to Havana to uh, greet his family uh, or relatives who were in Havana waiting and after a while these people started to rent these little boats and they came out and surrounded the ship and were yelling and shouting and calling for their relatives and this went on all day long. It was like a circus out there. Uh, I had cousins on board whose father was here in this country already. Uh, he was in Havana to uh, receive them and I felt so badly for them because they couldn't touch their father's hand or hug him or they just could kind of shout at each other, you know. He was uh, down there in this little boat and they, they would be either on deck or in their porthole trying to holler back at him. And so was everybody else doing that. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and then uh, all kinds of entrepreneurs came out, kids that would dive for pennies and or they would uh, sell oranges or pineapples for pennies and throw them up on deck with a little bag attached to the fruit and then you put your little bit of bunny in there and throw it back down. It was uh, a circus all day long. And eventually, um, while there were negotiations going on, the committee, which had been formed by the captain, uh, of course, uh, was in session 24 hours a day by this time. Uh, my father was uh, chosen as chairman of this committee. There, in the initial committee were five gentlemen and eventually two others uh, joined. Most of them were doctors and lawyers and I think there were two businessmen uh, on the committee. And uh, they were sitting with the captain sending out telegrams to New York to the Jewish agencies uh, because the Cuban government decided they would ask for an additional $500 per head and then they would consider perhaps letting us off and perhaps putting us in some kind of a, a camp uh, somewhere in Cuba. And somebody came from New York and uh, had the money with him but argued about the amount with the, pres with the president of Cuba, and this argument did not turn out in a, a favorable way. About the American coming and trying for a lower price with uh, the president of Cuba. Right. Uh, president of Cuba, his name was President Brew, uh, had set a deadline uh, for the uh, presentation of the demanded funds. And this gentleman from New York had the funds with him, but he thought he could perhaps uh, uh, argue him down a bit per capita and the president wasn't having any, and well, uh, 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 several days passed, and he declared that the time limit had elapsed, and there was no further conversation about this matter, and the ship was to leave. Uh, meanwhile, there was correspondence. Somebody suggested that the St. Louis come and bring us to an island off uh, the coast of New York. There were uh, all kinds of um, negotiations going on with New York, with other countries in the hemisphere, specifically the Dominican Republic. And uh, meanwhile, the captain needed at least 24 hours to load provisions because uh, obviously we had been underway for close to two weeks. We were in the harbor for a week and now we were supposed to leave. And he did, uh, he, he did go uh, to get the permission from the uh, Cubans, he went on land himself uh, to load provisions for another 24 hours. Uh, what we haven't touched upon is why did the St. Louis sail in the first place? Certainly the Germans were not interested in transporting out a thousand or so Jews. The Germans needed to send a, a spy to Havana to pick up information from uh, their agents who had been deported out of the United States after having secured secrets about submarines here in this country. The uh, Secret Service uh, got after them and they were expelled through the efforts of, I think, Mr. Hoover, well, at least through the Secret Service, and they escaped to Havana. Havana was the breeding ground for all kinds of um, ta uh, distasteful political activities. And so this uh, agent was dispatched by way of the ship. The Germans had in mind, first of all, the Jews will pay for the trip. Secondly, this was kind of a test run to see what the world's reaction would be to whatever outcome this particular trip would have. Uh, my personal opinion, my very personal opinion is that everything was already prearranged with the Cubans way ahead of time. 
that no matter what, the Cubans would not allow us to land and send us back to no man's land or wherever and to see whether the world would open up its countries and take these few people in who were all skilled people, either in the professions or in the trades, and uh, see what kind of world reaction there would be. Were any people at all allowed into Cuba? There were a handful, perhaps six or eight passengers who had absolutely legal immigration permits uh, who were allowed to disembark, in, including two children whose father was in Cuba, whose Aryan mother didn't want her Jewish children anymore and shipped them out of Germany to their father in Cuba. Uh, I don't know who the other people were. Some of them may have been Cuban citizens. Uh, whoever they were, they must have had very legal papers and they were able to get off the ship. But the, I don't think there were 10. I think it was less than 10 people who got off. We had connections in Cuba through these Cuban friends that my parents had made in Bonn who could have gotten us off. And my father, as the chairman of the committee, said he cannot do that. He cannot leave the committee. He cannot leave uh, everybody in the lurch, and he will not do it. And so we stayed on the ship. He also felt he would endanger our lives if we would try to get off the ship. So that was just a moot point. Uh, the next day after loading provisions, the ship left. Meanwhile, uh, getting back to the, to the espionage agent once more, uh, when we arrived in Cuba, he demanded to be allowed to uh, go on land. And the captain thought that he would pressure him and say, if our passengers can't get off, you can't get off. And so we had Gestapo on board too. Wherever there was German, there was Gestapo. They posed as firemen among the crew, but they were Gestapo. And the Gestapo said to the captain, if you don't let him off, we have your family in Germany. And so they threatened him and he had to let the, uh, the spy go uh, on land and he did his business there with the agents and, uh, and that was that, mission accomplished. And meanwhile, we were the pawns. How, so, how did you find out about the spy? In the did book that was written. Through but the, not, not through while efforts, it was going on? No, we had no idea about that and I guess the captain felt it best not to say anything to the committee about that either. Uh, only when the facts came out, when the book was written, did we find that out. Uh, after loading provisions the day after, the ship left Havana. Uh, and while we were still in the harbor, um, one afternoon after lunch, a gentleman who had been very despondent jumped overboard. <clears throat> a sailor jumped after him, and he cut his, the, uh, the man cut his wrists. And the sailor did save him, and the man was taken to a hospital in Havana, but his wife and daughter were not allowed to join him. They went back with the ship, and eventually, when he, his physical wounds were healed, the Cubans sent him back to England to join his family. And it was in full view of the passengers. I think my mother kind of whisked me away. I was on deck at the time also but um, she took me away. You know, people were crowding around the rails and she took me away. The passengers collected from their meager coinage and gave the sailor a reward for saving this man. And uh, the Gestapo took note of the fact that a German sailor bothered to jump into the water to save a Jew. Uh, we left Havana with the accompaniment of the harbor patrol and a whole procession of cars that drove along the uh, beach street, the Ocean Drive. And I guess it was one of the saddest days in people's lives when we left Havana. Uh, from there on in, there were always notices posted on the bulletin boards near the elevators which gave encouraging information. Even if there was nothing to encourage, there was encouraging information. We're in touch with this one and with that one and with this committee and that committee. 
and we will keep you informed and so on. Uh, all these documents were in my possession because of my father and are in the archives in Washington, D.C. at the Holocaust Museum. Uh, I have copies of almost everything that I gave them, but they have the originals. And the committee not only was meeting with the captain, but they also um, organized patrols so there wouldn't be another suicide attempt because people were very desperate. Most of the men on board <clears throat> had been incarcerated as a result of the November pogrom. And upon their release, they had to sign that they would leave Germany within a, a very short period of time and that they would never divulge what they experienced in their incarceration, nor would they return to the Third Reich upon uh, punishment of death. And so you can imagine that uh, there was panic on board. Uh, there were a group of teenage boys who were planning, um, what do you call it when somebody takes over a ship? Uh, mutiny. A mutiny. And it came to the ears of the committee, and they went to talk to these boys. They were maybe 18, 19, 20-year-olds. What will you do with a ship if you do this? You don't know anything about handling a ship or sailing a ship or anything else. And they, they, they were able to discourage them from pursuing this idea. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so there were patrols organized uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, from among the young men uh, to make sure that everybody was safe and so on and so forth. Uh, the telegrams kept coming and going and as we neared Germany there's a telegram in my father's handwriting to the uh, Hamburg America Line which is the company to which the ship belonged, the Hapak, uh, asking them to substitute another ship for us, to transfer us onto another ship but not to let us come back to Germany. In other words, if the St. Louis has to go back to its cruising schedule, send, bring us, get us on another ship. Meanwhile, the captain had confided in my father that if nothing else, he would take the St. Louis off the coast of Sussex and set it on fire. He didn't, he felt the way he was planning to do it, that, nobody would be endangered and the British would be forced to take us in. And he writes this in a little book that he himself wrote about the trip of the St. Louis, that that was his intention because he felt it was his duty, it was his job to deliver passengers to where they wanted to go. The captain was very much in sympathy to us. He was very cooperative. Yep. And again, he was on the bad list of the Gestapo. Where did you go from Cuba? Well, where was the next port they tried to we, disembark? On June 13th, a telegram came through saying that the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee headquarters in Paris under the direction of a Mr. Morris Troper had managed to get four countries to agree to take us in. I mean, this was like five minutes of midnight. England, Holland, Belgium, and France would each take in one quarter of the passengers. Uh, England made certain special requests that only people with um, papers to continue on to the United States they wanted to have, and if possible, uh, professional people. No other country made any other such demands. Uh, the ship uh, steered toward Antwerp, Belgium, and we arrived in Belgium. We embarked on May 13th, and we arrived in Antwerp, Belgium on June 17th. How do I remember that? That's my birthday, uh, my 11th birthday. And uh, Mr. Troper and his entourage came on board in Antwerp to, to meet the committee with whom he had been in close uh, uh, communication and to see for himself the passengers and to talk to them and encourage them and so on. Because it was my birthday and because of the work of my father, I was 
uh, uh, selected to greet Mr. Troper in the name of the children on board. And all the children stood around in a semicircle. My father wrote me a little speech. And among other things in that speech, it said that we would have liked to greet Mr. Troper with flowers, but after 40 days at sea, the flower shop was depleted of its merchandise. And so the next day, I got two dozen red roses from Mr. Troper, and that's what that little photograph in the book is all about. Um, when they came on board, the next, the next uh, activity was to divide up the passengers into the various countries. And that, again, was like playing God in a way. They didn't know it at the time, but it was. Some passengers, everyone was asked where they would like to go. Most people wanted to go to England. It puts a little distance between Germany and them with a little bit of water in between. And of course, that wasn't possible. Uh, whenever possible, they complied to the requests, you know. And some people had families in Holland or Belgium or France, or maybe they had some money there or whatever. Uh, but mostly it was up to uh, Mr. Troper's people and the committee to decide where people are going to go. The committee itself was allowed to choose. And even so, uh, several members did not choose England. And unfortunately, one of the members of the committee chose to go to France and he perished. He didn't uh, survive the war. He was among the youngest of the gentlemen, actually. Uh, that's a very unfortunate thing. Uh, when we arrived in Antwerp, everybody uh, came off the ship. Uh, the people in Belgium were sent to, from Antwerp were sent to Brussels, probably by train. People to Holland and France also were were sent by train to their destinations. The people to Holland were first uh, assembled in Westerbork, which was a camp because all of a sudden here come several hundred people, what are we gonna do with them? I think after a while people were probably able to find uh, some means of finding a home or even finding a job. In the case of the people who went to England, uh, we first ended up in a hotel. Uh, for my family, uh, my mother had a, a very close girlfriend who lived in York, England. And uh, as soon as she heard that we were coming to England, or my mother got in touch with her uh, via the uh, t uh, telegraph uh, communication system on board, and she requested us to come to York. So, uh, and uh, she was friendly with the Roundtree family, uh, Roundtree Chocolates, which is equal to Hershey Chocolates. And we were guests of the Roundtree family in York for several months. Let's back up from it. Where did you, how did you get to England? Were you by we, ship? We had to embark on a small German merchant ship, the SS Rakotis, R-A-K-O-T-I-S. Um, there, this was not a luxury ship. And most of the people, about 250 people, were in mass quarters. Only the committee people had cabins. And we had a steady stream of visitors using our bath and our shower and shaving in our bathroom and so on. And so all the other committee people as well. Uh, my father and I were taking a walk on deck and I noticed rolled up rolls lying along the, the deck against the wall. It looked like rolled up carpets. And I said to my dad, are they going to put new carpets on this ship? And he said, no, he says, those are cannon. You see, Hitler was ready. Hitler was ready. Uh, we crossed the channel. I don't know how long it took, but we arrived in Southampton from there by train to London. From this uh, train station in London per horse and buggy to the hotel. England was a quaint, quaint country when we got there in 1939. And uh, I guess uh, after a day or two uh, at the hotel, we uh, took the train to York. And we lived on the Roundtree Estate for three months. Uh, in the meantime, um, the people who came to England were guests. They were spe very special um, 
arrangements had been made for them, they were to be supported by the Jews, a Jewish agency with headquarters in the Bloomsbury House in London, and each family got a small amount of money for its uh, sustenance. They weren't allowed to work because at the time, I guess, uh, there wasn't enough work for British people. Or, and, and besides, we weren't supposed to be staying there for any length of time. This was June 1939, okay? Uh, after three months in York, my father felt that uh, nothing's happening in York. We wanted to get out of England. Our papers, meanwhile, <clears throat> had uh, were on their way via Switzerland, and he felt that we've got to be closer to where things are happening in London. And so uh, we, we thanked the Roundtree family very kindly. They were wonderful people. They were Quakers, and uh, they were so generous to us and we left for London. In London, we uh, got a room uh, with a family in Stamford Hill, a Jewish quarter of London. A lot of Orthodox Jews lived in that neighborhood. I think we arrived in London perhaps the end of August. It was the end of August. On September 1st, the Germans invaded Poland. All the school children in London were ordered to their schools to their schoolyards, and they wanted to evacuate all the children with their schools out of London. Well, we had just gotten there, and the neighborhood school was the Jewish Secondary School of London, a very fine school, very orthodox school. Uh, we, were, we were supposed to pack up clothes for several days, and uh, nice ladies along the way gave us food packages and, and snacks. And the older kids, I was then 11, and the, the older teenagers kept us entertained in the schoolyard. And this went on for three days. On September 3rd, England declared war on Germany, and all the schools moved out of London. And we ended up in Bedfordshire. Now, England isn't a very good country to begin with, and on the map, it doesn't look very far away from London. And uh, there we were billeted with the village folk who had volunteered to take in evacuees. I think the government subsidized each uh, evacuee. And I ended up together with a little boy whose family also lived in the same house where my parents were living at that time, uh, with the village shoemaker, Mr. and Mrs. Whittington. They had never seen a Jew. They had never seen a German Jew. My English was still not the most fluent, but I got along with it, except that whenever, and there were a lot of German and Austrian kids in this school, because it seemed to be a neighborhood, Stamford Hill, where refugees found places mm -hmm. to live. So amongst ourselves, we would talk German, and we were told you, we may not talk German on the streets, we were gonna be punished, and I know I got, I got, uh, a smack in the face from a teacher one day because he overheard me talking German in the street. I changed my name from Liesel to Elizabeth because Liesel was too German a name. And we had classes in the local church. And we had a kosher canteen where we ate the main meal. It was kind of like a Camp Ramah situation in a way, except it wasn't. But the ruach was there, the spirit was there. All of a sudden, I was living an Orthodox Jewish life. I was eating. O I was only allowed to eat uh, uh, breakfast and high tea with my uh, foster family, and our main meal was a kosher meal uh, in our canteen. We all had KP. We all had to share serving, and uh, there was such a spirit about all this. Everybody was in the same boat. I became very friendly with a lovely uh, girl who was about a year older than myself. I had other friends too, but she was my confidant because again, I was separated from my parents. Mm -hmm. I had been in Bonn separated. Now under other circumstances in a strange country with a strange language, I was again separated from my parents. Do you know the girl's name? Yes, mm -hmm. the girl's name at the time was Rita Hauser. Uh, she came from Essen, and uh, like we were best friends. 
uh, we lost touch with each other around the time that I got married here uh, in 1947. And about uh, after the reunion in Miami in, 18, in 1989, one day I got a letter from England. I opened it and out flutters this little piece of Xerox paper and it was a copy of something I had written into her autograph book when we all went to school together and through, me, through friends who also went to Miami for the reunion, she found me again and now we're back in touch and she was here and uh, we're communicating. It's just a little side vignette, though Rita was my best friend. Um, I remember the first months of the war, there wasn't really any evidence of war. Everybody mm -hmm. carried this little gas mask box around with them, and they had uh, air raid rehearsals. And I know one night, even in this little village, the sirens went. And the little boy and I, who were living with our foster family, we were sleeping in a double bed together. And I said to him, his name was Eddie, I said, Eddie, put on your gas mask. <laughs> we put on our gas mask and went back to sleep. And in the mornings when the landlady came to wake us up, she screeched because there are these two little monsters in the bed with the gas masks on. But we really didn't uh, notice there was much of a war going on that first year. I went to London twice to visit my parents, once at Hanukkah time and once at Pesach time. and. Uh, uh, in May, I think things turned around completely. There was the Battle of Dunkirk when the British officers were all at the Ascot races and Hitler could have taken England at that time without batting an eyelash. And I think only because of his astrologers advised him uh, against it, uh, this didn't happen. But all of a sudden, first of all, all the German and Austrian males were rounded up and interned. Uh, they were interned uh, mostly on the Isle of Man in camps because the British claimed that there were German spies posing as Jewish refugees amongst them and they just put the whole lot, put, uh, interned them, isolated them. Uh, they didn't mistreat them, but they were not free. Uh, at that time, it was almost the end of the school year, and I went back to London to join my mother. She was all by herself. I had earned myself some extra money by helping the farmers. All of us did that. We were asked to help the farmers when it got to be spring, and we would be on the fields by 5 o'clock picking peas and picking berries and whatever, and they paid us a few pence per bushel or whatever, and so, and my, my landlord also let me, he was the shoemaker and he, he had me carrying out shoes that he fixed for people and he paid me a few pennies for each pair of shoes. So I was able to give my mother money so she could use it for car fare to go to various offices downtown to get my father ready for our immigration because meanwhile our number had come up, our papers were in England, we could leave if we would know how to get out of there. There was also a question of paying the fare. You see, what we didn't have any money. And we wanted to get out of England, and there's correspondence that I found uh, in my mother's papers about the monies that people paid for the immigration, the immigration certificates issued by the Cuban government, which were not declared not legal. You see, I mm -hmm. didn't touch upon that before. The Cuban okay. immigration officer, uh, as his name was Gonzalez, uh, had simply printed these immigration permits on official looking stationery and he sold them for whatever, he sold them through another party. Uh, many of them were refugees living in Cuba. He probably sold them to these people for a set sum of money and then these people were selling them to us for whatever they could get. Uh, what happened after we got to England was that a lot of people wrote to my father and said, couldn't he in some way try to get that money back because we never used the permits. 
and some people wrote, and I have those letters. I have some of those letters. They came from all over. Some people paid 150. It was all dollars. 150 dollars per permit. Some paid 200. Uh, various sums of money were paid, and uh, people figured that maybe with that money they would be able to pay their passage to get out of England. Well, your father was asked to try to get the money from the Cuban visas. Well, the Cuban immigration permits, actually. Yeah. And uh, I have uh, copies. I have these, some of these letters. I found them only recently, maybe uh, a couple of years ago, uh, among my mother's papers. My mother only passed away about uh, two and a half years ago, and so uh, I didn't know all the material that she still had uh, beside what I already had. And these people said we pay, everybody seemed to have paid a different price for these uh, papers. And my father, I have correspondence that uh, I went over last night uh, where my father uh, addressed the uh, uh, Cuban authorities and there was uh, absolutely no way that anybody was willing to give any kind of money back. First of all, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, he didn't sell them to the people, right? He sold them to somebody else and all these other people might have disappeared, or uh, what, uh, the Cuban government pocketed the money, if nothing else. And and uh, it was a moot point. There was nothing to be, nothing to be had, uh, unfortunately. And he couldn't do anything for the people. Uh, somehow or other, people were able to scrape together, perhaps through uh, Jewish organizations, perhaps through private contributions, the monies to pay for the passage to the United States. I'm not quite sure where our passage money came from. However, we, uh, we uh, left London the end of August. Uh, our ship was leaving from Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, while my father was interned, uh, the Blitz of London had begun, and I had returned to London to be with my mother. Uh, we had raids every day and specifically every night for the next three months, June, July, August. My mother and I ended up in the air raid shelter every single night. Each We lived at that time in a rooming house in Williston Green, which is in the northwest two area of London, a nice neighborhood. The house belonged to a couple of teachers who made it a rooming house. They didn't live there and each room held a family of refugees. Not necessarily, there were two St. Louis families in this house. There was a Polish opera singer. There uh, were uh, Belgian refugees. It was quite a mixture. And uh, for everything, you had to put money in, in, a, in a slot. If you wanted a bath, you, you put some pennies in. If you wanted heat, if you wanted to cook, everything, uh, had to be uh, were little automats to put money in. So I know my parents told me they hung out a lot in the library because it was warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Uh, they got together with a lot of uh, St. Louis people socially. That was their only entertainment. They surely didn't have money to go to a movie. Uh, they bought yesterday bread and yesterday cake for a few pennies and everybody bought their own cups and saucers because everything was counted out where they lived and they got together and in spite of everything they had a good time until my father was interned the men were interned and things got very serious so my, every night we had raids the city was bombed and each house had what was called an anderson shelter an anderson shelter consisted of a hole in the ground with a corrugated uh, metal uh, arc cover over it, which was then covered with a lot of dirt, so you, from the air you couldn't see what there was anything there. And there were a few wooden slats along the walls of this, uh, this uh, dugout area uh, on, on some, some bricks, and that's where we sat. We were dressed for winter because the nights were cool, even in August. 
and in July, and we had about uh, 12 hours worth of food with us. Every night this was going on. We went to bed, after a while the sirens rang. Some people went into the subways because London's underground was very low below the ground, but we just went into the shelter. Mostly the men stayed outside unless it got serious and the bombing got close and then they would all jump into the shelter also. Do you remember? So we never slept in a bed for three months for a whole night, my mother and I. Do you remember the names of any of the people that were in the house with you? Yeah, I remember a family hymen from Cologne across the hall from us. And they had a daughter, Susan. And uh, of course, the, the other family from the St. Louis was uh, actually uh, one of the committee gentlemen with his family, uh, uh, a lawyer by the name of Hausdorfer with his wife and daughter. They lived downstairs, and then there was a Hungarian lady. Her first name was Bergi, and, uh, I, and uh, I don't remember the Polish opera singer's name or the Irish ladies upstairs, but those are the names I do remember. Uh, and also, one of the more humorous aspects was that the opera singer never paid his rent on time, and so regularly the landlady came and threw his belongings in a suitcase down the steps, and he would call the police, and they wouldn't come because they were tired of it. <laughs> so <laughs> it was it was a, a comic situation among some very serious business. And uh, meanwhile, my mother ran down the doors of the various offices of the government to try and get my father processed so we could leave. And she, uh, she managed it, and he was brought to London under guard of Scotland Yard like a criminal. They saw each other from across the street. I think he managed to slip her a note. And, uh, and then we, uh, I don't remember the exact date when we were trained for Glasgow, but it was an overnight ride, and, and we were stopped by air raids several times during the night, the train stopped. The rumor was that the men from uh, the internment camps uh, who were scheduled to board with us were in a sealed car at the end of the train, again under Scotland Yard guard. Um, we got to Glasgow and they brought us to the ship, the SS Cameronia was the name of the ship, C-A-M-E-R-O-N-I-A. -E who wasn't there was my father and the other men who were expected. And we waited and we waited. I think we were supposed to sail toward evening. And finally, maybe an hour before sailing time, the men came on board. What had happened was that they put them on another ship to go to Australia. So you see, the British <coughs> had shipped many young single men of, of military age who were among those internees, had shipped them off to Australia and New Zealand. And uh, somebody thought that this batch of men were also supposed to be destined, and I think they, they mutinied. And so finally, they appeared on the ship, and that was quite a reunion. The ship left, we had on board with us uh, the entire, there was only two class, second class and third class on, in this case. Second class was entirely British children who are being sent to this hemisphere for the duration to the States and to Canada. And we had a convoy that uh, crossed, crossed with us. <clears throat> Luckily, we made it. We were pursued by German submarines. The ship before and after us were, uh, were uh, torpedoed. We got through, luckily. And so we arrived in New York on September 10, 1940. We hadn't seen a city in lights for years because even before, even when we still lived in Germany, there were demi blackouts, and uh, there were there were uh, air raid practices long before Germany was in the war. Everybody had to have an air raid shelter in their house, and we hadn't seen a city lit up. Well, uh, when we first arrived in London, I suppose, uh, but uh, in this whole year, and here was New York City. Our relatives who had provided the affidavit for us, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kurt Blum of Philadelphia, 
uh, picked us up at the ship. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Blum's father-in-law, uh, his name was Moses Lieberman, uh, and at the time a, a vice president of Snellenberg's department store here was an additional sponsor since Mr. Blum's sponsorship was not enough financially to sustain us. Uh, the relationship officially was that, Mr. that my parents were Mr. Blum's aunt and uncle. Basically, not quite. Uh, my mother's sister had married into the family of Mr. Blum's mother. And so they were really just in-laws, indirectly, mahudden, as we would say. Uh, however, uh, when uh, Mr. Blum was still young and his father passed away in Germany in the 20s, uh, my mother spent a whole year in his house to help his mother get ready to emigrate to the States because at that time already she had several brothers here who wanted her to come over since she was widowed. Uh, this was the Heidelberger family who for a long period of time had a chocolate factory here in Philadelphia, uh, Brothers Heidelberger Chocolates. And uh, so it was perhaps a favor we paid and perhaps it was simply because they wanted to help. But I will never stop being grateful to the Blums for helping us to come to this country. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. My children wouldn't be here. Where did you settle? When we first came here, we came to Philadelphia right away, and uh, I lived with the, the Blums for a whole year because uh, my parents at the time had no means of, of keeping me. My mother was a domestic in a household. My father, uh, as a lawyer, certainly couldn't pursue his uh, profession here. Uh, at the time we arrived here, my father was 58 years old. He was not in good health. And um, he started out by peddling European-made candy from door to door. And he developed uh, all kinds of um, contacts that way. Eventually, he, uh, he got a job as a translating editor with a German newspaper here in Philadelphia. And that was a very good job for those days. Um, the newspaper was called the Philadelphia Gazette Democrat. And it actually had published here already through World War I and through World War II until the 50s. I think it then became a weekly and eventually it merged with a New York German newspaper called the New York Staatszeitung. I don't know if that's still in existence, but um, any, at any rate, my father worked there uh, until he became too ill to work. Um, my father had a problem that nobody seemed to know what it was. Uh, he was treated for gallbladder, he was treated for all kinds of theories. Uh, he saw big doctors in Europe, he saw big doctors right here in the United States. Nobody could figure out what was wrong. After he died, we had an autopsy taken simply because we felt he would have wanted that. And it turns out that he had a hiatal hernia that pressed on the heart. For years he would have terrible pains like a heart attack and he would be able to sometimes stop them by pressure. Uh, and therefore he never wanted to have any exploratory surgery. Mm. Uh, we think that this originated uh, in a toboggan accident that he had in Italy as a bachelor. He used to go to Italy tobogganing as a bachelor. And ever since that accident that he had, he had this problem. Uh, they treated him for gallbladder at the end, and uh, he lost, that was a fatless diet, and he lost whatever little strength he had left. And unfortunately, I was only 17 when my father passed away. Um, that was in 1945. I was still in high school. And he told me one day while we were sitting at breakfast and before I was going to school that he didn't think uh, he could last much longer and I should look after my mother. And that's how he sent me to school that day. And uh, Thanksgiving of 1945, he passed away, much too early. And what did you and your mother do? 
My mother had a job, I mean, and I was still in high school when my father died. I was a, a junior in high school. Um, I had a job after school. I worked as a salesperson in Gimbel's Wednesday nights and Saturdays all day, and I gave my all my money to my mother except, I think, two dollars. That was my allowance. And uh, my mother worked in a jewelry store for a long time. You know, after that first year when she was a domestic and my father was peddling candy, after that she got a job in a factory. And then once my father got this job in the, with a the newspaper, they were able to get an apartment and I moved back with them. I had lived with the Blums for one year. And then after three years, I was finally back with my parents. And where did you go to school after high school? Uh, well, I went to Philadelphia High School for Girls, and uh, then I got married uh -huh. right out of high school. How I did you had, meet your husband? Well, uh, there was a uh, German-Jewish club here in Philadelphia called the Central Club. It was a club for Jews from Central Europe. Uh, my husband had been one of the founders, and his brother as well. It was uh, at the time that I joined, it was on North Broad Street near Susquehanna, and we lived on Park Avenue near, in that neighborhood, near the old Adams Jeshurun Synagogue. And uh, there was a youth group, and once I was 16 or so, I was of age to join the youth group. I was one of the younger ones. And this was during the war. There were very, only, uh, the only young men around were 4Fs. Everybody else was in the service. Uh, nevertheless, there was a place to go to, there was ping pong to play, there were records to, to listen to, and uh, letters to write to the, the boys who were in the service, and when somebody came home on leave, they usually always came to the club. It, and, and my mother, it was within walking distance of where we lived, and my mother didn't have to worry where I was hanging out. Uh, there was a restaurant in the clubhouse where you could have very good and reasonable meals. Often my family used to eat there Friday nights, and Fridays was my father's day off, and so sometimes uh, he would treat for dinner to go out there. And it was a good place, and, and I met young people there, mm -hmm. you know, and people who had the same background as myself. My American classmates didn't have a clue. Nobody ever asked, and I never told. I wanted to fit in. But these were all people who had the similar background. The experience of, uh, of uh, persecution in Germany and of losing family, uh, family whom we later found out after the war was over, who perished in concentration camps under the most dire circumstances, and people who had to start life from scratch, who came here with nothing, the young pe many of the young people didn't have the privilege of going to school anymore. They were teenagers, which included my husband. He was 18 when he came over here. He came in 1937. He brought over his parents and his two brothers and supported them until he went into the service. Uh, and his name was? His name was Hans Loeb. Uh, <laughs> he was a wonderful person, and I met him after he came out of the service. He was with the American Army Air Force. Uh, he was uh, stationed in Europe, and he was in Europe still during the war. He was in European theater still during the war, toward the end of the war. And um, he came back, and I met him in the fall of 1946 uh, in the club. We went on a hike, and I came with one guy, and I left with him. And uh, that started a two months courtship, and then we got engaged. I was still in high school. My mother had gone visiting my cousin in Connecticut, and she said, you see, I can't ever leave you alone. You're gonna do something. And uh, after uh, I graduated in January of 47, and we got married June 1st of 47. And we were married two weeks short of 40 years. And all that time you lived in the Philadelphia area? Philadelphia, area. yes. We had two children, Joan and Joel. And uh, those children are all grown up by now. Um, my daughter, Joan, is married. Uh, she is a very versatile person, having been a television producer and director at Channel 29. 
an art director at a newspaper in Mo Missoula, Montana, and finally a teacher at Quaker Town Friends School. And she has uh, a son, Asha, my oldest grandson, who is my sunshine. I have a son, Joel. Um, Joel lives in Virginia with his wife, Susan. By the way, Joni is married to Robert Michener, a, uh, a TV person, a completely well-rounded TV person, an engineer. And my son is married to Susan Halsey. They both work for Marriott Corporation. My son is uh, director of projects for human resources. And my daughter-in-law uh, is in charge of menus. They work at the international headquarters in Bethesda, Maryland for Marriott. They have two children. Uh, the oldest one will be six soon. His name is Benjamin Hans. And the uh, little girl is uh, going to be three in a couple of weeks, and her name is Lexis Falsey Lope. That's my family. Is there uh, anything else you would like to tell us about your life yes. here, your adult life here? Uh, my adult life here, I went to art school after high school. I went to Philadelphia College of Art for a short time. I worked at Temple University Library for a while, then I got into the art field, which was my goal. Uh, eventually, after about five years of marriage, I had children. We moved into a house, and I stayed home and raised my children. Uh, I was very active in PTA. I was very active on the Jewish scene here in Philadelphia. I was uh, president of my sisterhood. We belonged to Congregation Tikva Hadosha, which was a German Jewish congregation. My husband was one of the founders. Uh, I also, at the uh, same time, we belonged to Adif Jeshurun, which was where I was confirmed, where I was married. And after Tikva Hadosha closed its doors because of attrition, we uh, uh, were solely at AJ. My children were confirmed there. My son was bar mitzvah there. I'm still there. I was active with the uh, women's movement for conservative Judaism, Philadelphia branch. And I went back to work when my children were about 11 and 13. And again, went back into the art field. I went to school, to night school again, and uh, worked uh, first for my, I was art director for manufacturing concern for 10 years. I worked uh, as an uh, artist, graphic artist, and German correspondent for an electronic firm. And then my last job uh, was another 10 year stint with a printing house as graphic designer. Uh, my husband passed away, unfortunately, uh, over nine years ago. And we were just two weeks short of our 40th anniversary. Uh, he had a bad heart. He had uh, two open heart surgeries and he didn't make it out of the second one, unfortunately. It was my sadness that he was already retired at that time, that uh, being 10 years younger, I wasn't entitled to be retired yet and we couldn't play together and that's something that I've always regretted very much. Um, he busied himself with part-time work in real estate and uh, after he passed away, that was a very difficult adjustment for me. I think more than any other that I've had to make in my life, including the emigration and resettling in various countries. But uh, you do, you learn to cope. I mean, you know, you cope with everything else and you learn to cope with that too. My children were extremely supportive. My daughter at the time lived in Montana so that wasn't too close, but my son was close by and a tremendous support for me. And after about two years, I met an old friend whom I had known 40 some years ago. And uh, he was in the meantime, he had lived here, he had lived in Israel, he's a survivor of Auschwitz. He has his own story to tell. And. Uh, we started to see each other, and we've been together now over seven years. At the moment, I'm recovering from surgery, and he is a caretaker beyond description. And his name and is? His name is Max Perkow. 
Did you ever go back to your home? Yes, I did. Uh, our first visit back to Germany was in 1963 when we had the opportunity of joining a charter trip to Düsseldorf for a printing convention which takes place there every year with friends of ours who are in the business. We were the only non-printers on the plane. And at that time, I have to tell you, I was very nervous about returning to Germany. Um, my nanny came to meet us at the plane and the whole plane knew about this reunion. You know, everybody watched this when she stood there with a bunch of flowers and we saw each other again. And at that time, I, my husband took me to his hometown, which was Andernach, a small town on the Rhine near Koblenz. And that was a very tearful experience. Uh, it was a very small town. At the time he lived there, there were just 10,000 10, people. And the Loeb family was very well known. They were in the uh, distilling business, wine and distilling business, liquor distilling business, and they were well known. He had been there as an, a GI and arrested a few Nazis, which meanwhile got out again. And uh, as I said, it was rather a tearful experience. I met a cousin again in Andernach who had been an Auschwitz survivor and was on business in Germany from South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I met the daughter of the Steinfeld family uh, on that occasion also. We talked about them uh, being our benefactors during mm -hmm. the uh, pre-war days and uh, she had survived a uh, concentration camp. Who was her name? Her name was then Anita um, Van Gelder. And what was the name of your cousin? My cousin was Heinz Hessdorfer. Uh, he was my father's sister's son who survived Auschwitz, who wrote his memoirs and that's how we found out what was going on in the camps. He had a brother and his mother, both who didn't survive. Um, at that occasion, I went back to my hometown with my husband and my nanny and her husband uh, accompanied us. I boldly rang the bell uh, at my house and I said, uh, my name is Liesl Joseph Loeb. I used to live here. Would you allow me to come in and show my husband the house? The woman who had bought the house for my mother was a schoolmate of my mother, and she bought the house at the time for peanuts. Later on, she had to pay restitution to my mother. And I think she was, I mean, she was as pale as a ghost when I told her who I was, and she let us in and, and look at the house. And uh, I realized that was really uh, not nice of me. To <laughs> that was a bombshell, but I didn't want anything from her. I just wanted to see my house again. Somehow or other, that house was the embodiment of the security of my childhood. I don't know how else to explain that, you know. And that was always in my mind. I had to go back and see if it was really there. So that was the first occasion. On a later visit, uh, we took our children. They were then of college age. And uh, my husband, his two brothers, their children, we and our children agreed to meet in Germany in Andernach uh, to have an experience with our children. You were talking about your trip back to Germany with your children. Yes. It was always uh, in my dream that someday I would uh, take my children back to my hometown and to the house where I was raised and uh, to show them their roots. And uh, it became a reality uh, in 1979. No, it was 1975, I'm sorry. 1975. I think both children were still in college. Uh, Joni was two years ahead of Joel. And as a matter of fact, uh, 
It was arranged so that the two of them would have a taste of Europe by themselves by going to England for a week together. Uh, and we then met up with them in Germany. Meanwhile, my husband uh, has two, had two brothers and uh, each brother had one of his children along and we all met eventually in their hometown of Andernach. We stayed in a uh, small hotel right on the Rhine embankment uh, and uh, we kind of took over the whole floor of the hotel. Um, also my, my nanny joined us there with her husband and uh, uh, we visited the home where my husband was born and raised and that house by the way had a date on it uh, from the 1600s it was a very old house and Andernach was a very old town uh, where is it near pardon where is it near it's near Koblenz it's on the Rhine it was uh, founded by the Romans and as a matter of fact they had their thousandth anniversary a few years ago the town of Andernach and there were Jews there already, uh, I think, in the 10th century. Uh, <clears throat> after, after meeting in Andernach, uh, I took my children to write, but this time I didn't do what I did the last time. I had written to the owner of the house, and I explained to her that I was coming to Germany with my children. I would very much appreciate if she would allow me one more time to show my children the house where I was born and raised. And she wrote back to me that uh, by now she wasn't living there herself anymore, that she had converted the house into two apartments, but that she would instruct her tenants to allow us to come in and see the house. So uh, when we uh, came to Reit, um by the way, in Andernach we also went to the cemeteries. The Jewish cemetery in Andernach was beautifully kept uh, by the town, by the town, and the children could see the Loeb family burial grounds and 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 uh, have a reality of their heritage and of their roots. Uh, we did the same thing in in Reit. Uh, actually, my mother's family was buried in the next little town, Odenkirchen, which is where my my mother was born. That cemetery was not in such a great condition, unfortunately. But we were able, again, to show them the family names, Salmon family and Simon family, other family names that were of the parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and so on. My mother's uh, family was in that uh, town for several generations, whereas my father had moved into the area from southern Germany. Uh, and I uh, took the children into the house and uh, we took some pictures. The house had undergone some changes uh, uh, in inside decorating and architecture since it was now a two-family uh, house. It is in beautiful condition. It is a, a house of a particular architectural style and they really uh, put it into pristine condition. Uh, also, the garden was, uh, again, uh, very nice. We had a big garden at one time, but I think a bomb had killed every plant and every fruit tree uh, during the war, and at that time, it started to look a little bit like it was before. And uh, after, we, after we left the house, my children said, you know, Mom, it was like we were visiting Opa Zepp. Opa Zepp was my father. His nickname was Zepp. And I always talked a great deal about him to my children, uh, uh, whatever came up, you know, because I had many fond memories of things that we did together or things that we talked about. And my children were, it was, uh, so they knew him and they felt they had had a visit with him by visiting the house. and. That gave me such a warm and good feeling. Another thing that happened on that trip, and I remember exactly where it was, we were on a small funicular going up some mountain along the Rhine. And the kids, and we had not really talked about uh, how we felt about going back to Germany. We didn't want them to have any preconceived notions, actually. And the kids said to me, you know, Mom, 
um, it's nice to meet some of the young people we're meeting, but we always feel a little funny when we meet people of Omi's age. Omi was my mother, and that's what, that, that, that's what they called her. And you know, that was a revelation to me that they got this feeling, because naturally those were the people who were our persecutors. My mother's generation, we were children, but our parents were the ones who were persecuted by their peers. And somehow the children got this feeling and I just felt this was a complete success, this trip. I, it was very pleasant to be there with the, their cousins, you know, and, and my husband took them to all the places that he cherished as a youngster. Uh, we went all, on top of the mountain near Andernach where he used to go with his friends and, and places where he rode his bike and uh, to small towns along the Rhine that are still very picturesque. And, We'd stop in restaurants and, uh, and enjoy the view of the boats going up and down the river and so on. It was a most pleasant experience. Could you just tell us the name of your brothers-in-law and their children who were with you? Yes, my oldest brother-in-law was Dr. Ernst Loeb. He was a professor at the uh, Queen's College in Kingston, Ontario, professor of Germanics. Uh, uh, his wife Margot was not along on that trip, but his daughter Karen was. Uh, she was actually married to a German boy and living at the time near Frankfurt. Uh, Karen today lives in the Seattle area where her brother Dennis also lives. So part of the Loeb family lives in Seattle. My younger brother Kurt Loeb uh, was along with his wife Lucille who is, lives five minutes away from here, and we're very good friends. And he had his son Mark along. Uh, Mark has a brother, Bart, and the two of them are in business together, and they live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My brother-in-law now lives in, Saratob in Sarasota. He's divorced from Lucille, but we see him in the wintertime, and I see Lucille often. Okay. Now, tell us about your next trip. My... Uh, Next trip to Germany was in 1982 when the city of Bonn invited me since I had been living there for a short time. Um, we had heard about these get-togethers and uh, the city of Bonn paid for me and for my husband the uh, fare. Uh, when we arrived there, our hotel uh, arrangements had been made in one of the first-class hotels, uh, the Königshof on the Rhine. And we also got uh, 200 marks of spending money. Uh, the whole week had been programmed with not only entertainment, such as trips, boat trips on the Rhine, and a concert uh, for the Beethoven Festival that was uh, there, and a wonderful party by the Chancellor, uh, a spring festival at the Chancellor's house. We were also invited to attend uh, uh, the um, government institutions. What was the reason for the invitation? The reason for the invitations that are still happening and were at that time in full swing was to extend a hand of reconciliation to build a bridge with their expatriates that are still alive and to have some communication with them. Uh, and these invitations were made at the same time with feelings of trepidation by the hosts as to how they would be received, these invitations, and how we would react to them when we come there. Uh, as it turns out, the visits all turned out very well, especially in the city of Bonn. Uh, first of all, because they seem to have the financial means and the facilities to organize a week of programs, as I said, not just entertainment, but also, for instance, conversations with young people and interreligious conversations between Jews and non-Jews. Uh, we were uh, hosted by private families on occasion, and we had much contact with interested citizens. Naturally, there were also disinterested citizens for these visits, and this happened all over. 
<clears throat> Almost all the s major cities in Germany and many small towns have organized these visits. It happens that the city of Bonn is still doing it. <clears throat> there are many people who, are, um, men, uh, many of the people surviving live in Europe and want to meet each other in their hometown every year. So this time, uh, this uh, each year, uh, the city invites anybody who's ever been there and anybody who hasn't been there yet. At, uh, the people who've been there before come at their own expense, both transportation-wise and hotel-wise, but the city organizes a week full of programs that they provide. This, I don't think any other city does that but Bonn. And each year I get an invitation, but I haven't gone back since. I have a friend who does go back uh, once in a while, who lived, the daughter of the cantor, whom I mentioned before, she has gone back uh, once or twice. Um, that was in 1982, and in 1989 I received an invitation from my hometown of Veit. And uh, I was invited to bring uh, an accompanist uh, husbands and in my children and in my case it was one of my children my mother received an invitation and she was very loath to go she really never wanted to go back to germany and i convinced her she must go because she's the one who remembers the most she's of the generation that knows so much so much more because we were children and I convinced her, and so the two of us took both Joni and Joel along. Again, the, our fare was provided, our hotel arrangements were provided. We, uh, we did not get uh, additional spending money, but uh, that wasn't important anyway. But what I was so excited about this time was that I was going to meet some of my school friends whom I hadn't seen since we were 10 years old. Let me tell you, that's a culture shock. You remember this little boy, this tow-haired little kid that you grew up with? In this case, it was my father's partner's son. And you know, being an only child, I was so much at their house because they had four children and each child had friends over all the time. And I loved being over there. And uh, we were together almost every day. So, uh, we, we traveled, uh, and first of all, we saw people we knew in the hotel already, and the first event was a get-together a, a get to meet each other in, in the town hall in München Gladbach. This time, Weid is no longer a separate community, but mm. München Gladbach has three towns uh, combined into one municipality now. The town where my mother was born, Odenkirchen, Weid, and München Gladbach. And uh, the, uh, as, uh, some of the assemblies took place in München Gladbach, and some of them took place in Wright. Um We also had a team along from the 2020 television show, because somebody was related to somebody who was connected with that show, and they filmed the whole thing. My daughter also filmed the whole thing, and I think her, her film is just as good as the other one. And. Uh, there we were in a big hall with some familiar faces, with some faintly familiar faces, and somebody pointed out a portly man to me with glasses and gray hair and a mustache, and he wore a hat, and they said, there he is, it were his sisters to be exact. And there was this little tow-haired kid 50 years later, culture shock. <laughs> Not only that, I fell around his neck and kissed him and hugged him, and he looked at me like, who's this crazy woman? <laughs> he ha he's very orthodox, and this was strictly taboo. What is his he name? I'd rather not say. Oh. He lives in Brazil, and um, he didn't see fit to communicate with me whatsoever. Okay. But I, I, I do see one of his sisters every year when I go to Israel. She lives in Israel. And uh, we commiserate about old times. As I said, her father was my father's partner. And so it's, it's, it's a touch of home for both of us when we get together. There's another friend who lives in Atlanta. Uh, her name is Erica Hecht. And uh, her, father her father or her uncle was the controller in my grandfather's factory. 
we went we were in the same school but she's not at the same age but there also is a touch of home you know even though we were thrown out we were thrown out of our homes uh, we were kicked out but there is this there is this feeling for home and roots that doesn't leave you no matter what and some people can't understand that they can't understand why we would want to go back to germany why we would want to be the guests uh, of the, the nation that didn't want us in the first place they don't understand first of all because we wanted to see each other again see who's coming and secondly because that's where our roots are on those mm -hmm. cemeteries are buried up our grandparents and our great grandparents and our communities were built up by some of our contributions and our family's contributions and most of all we had the chance to talk to the young people there and that was one of my big reasons for going. Uh, when the invitation arrived, first of all, we got a letter from a family who said they were going to be our hosts. It was a husband and wife, each one a teacher, each one born in the 40s, so they were not of the Hitler generation. They had two daughters, and they invited us to their home, and they came to see us, and there were flowers in our rooms from them. And they are the loveliest people. I'm still in touch with them. They were very gracious to us and joined the program. This was voluntary. There were people there that didn't come out of the walls while we were there, you know. Mm -hmm. But it was important. I spoke in several schools, in a, in a uh, Catholic school, in an elementary school, and in a high school. Many of the children had been prepared by reading literature about the Holocaust or reading, reading stories. They asked intelligent questions and they were very concerned whether we blamed them. That was a, a, a universal question. Do you blame us? And we can't tell young people that we blame them. You know, I think they felt relieved. And since this was the one and only invitation that our town extended simply because they just invited everybody who survived because it was a small Jewish mm -hmm. community in the first place, they too had uh, their trepidations about how we would receive them and how they would receive us and whether there would be uh, animosity or whatever. And it doesn't happen. It really doesn't happen. I've heard from so many people who've gone over with a chip on their shoulder or who go over and say, well, we'll take what we can get from them, but we don't really want to go. Or as somebody expressed in our group, my heart said yes and my brain said no. You know, mm -hmm. and you come away feeling better. You definitely come away feeling better. And I think these visits are important because some of these young people don't know what is a Jew. They have no a, a clue, you know. Mm -hmm. Are we people with horns? Are we with murderers with uh, blood on our hands of Christian babies? Or who, who the heck knows what they think? Now, what was the reason for your trip to Miami? The trip to Miami took place the same year, uh, 1989, which was the 50th anniversary from 1939 of the voyage of the St. Louis. One of the survivors uh, was a man by the name of Herbert Carliner, who lives in Miami. Herbert Carliner was a 13-year-old boy on the St. Louis when it uh, passed the uh, beachfront of Miami. You know, the captain had tried to land us in Miami. He came very close, and the American government sent military planes to make sure that we would keep moving and the, and the shore patrol. The Congress sent those planes down to make sure we kept on moving. We were that close. We could see the hotels on the beach. We were that close. And he thought to himself, if I ever have the chance, that's where I want to live. Herbert Carl and I ended up in France. He was, his parents uh, took him and his brother to an orphanage. He had two sisters. And uh, the two sisters and his parents did not survive. The boys who were hidden in an orphanage did. He came to the States after the war, and he went to Miami to live. He opened a bakery. He did well for himself. And he eventually uh, uh, 
wanted to give back to the orphanage something, and so he wrote to them that he would like to support a child in that orphanage. orphanage. And uh, after a while, he started getting letters from a teenage girl. And to make a long story short, after three years, he went over there and he married her. Uh, he lives in, in Miami now. He's retired. He's very active with the Miami um, Holocaust Memorial. And he was the one who organized a reunion of St. Louis survivors on the, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of our passing Miami Beach. Uh, he had the help of a local politician, also a, a, a survivor, actually. I can't think of his name right now. And uh, they, they got in touch with, uh, I don't know how they found various people, but uh, we were 29 actual survivors in Miami, plus entourage, husbands, wives, friends, and whatever. Uh, and uh, we were lodged at the Fountain Blow Hotel. Uh, I was uh, rooming with a young woman that I had met in the interim through my appearance uh, on Good Morning America with my mother uh, when the uh, film came out, Voyage of the Damned. She lives in Boston and we're still very much in touch and we were roommates together. We arrive at the Fountain Blow and I want to check in, and the uh, person says, Mr. So-and-so paid for your room. And I thought to myself, what do they think of me? Mr. So-and-so is paying for my room? But apparently, he had this, this politician had decided uh, to, to do that. You know, he footed the bill for our hotel stay in Miami. And uh, this was actually a weekend occasion. Uh, we had, again, a meeting, a get-together, and uh, most of us didn't recognize each other. We were children on board. There was the oldest person who came was a 90-some-year-old lady um, who was remarkable in her presence of mind. And she was, of course, of my mother's generation. My mother didn't make the trip. She didn't feel up to it. She was still alive at that time, but she didn't feel up to it. The youngest was a 51-year-old very beautiful woman who was a baby on the arms of her parents on the ship. And uh, somebody had brought photographs, and we were looking at photographs from the ship, and she said, oh, that's me and my parents. She saw herself on the arms of her parents. They had ended up in France. When the Germans invaded, her parents had given her to a farmer had in, uh, informed uh, relatives here in this country that they had given the child to this farmer and the parents perished. After the war, the, the uncle and aunt came to France and found her and took her back to the States and raised her. Can you tell yes. us the name of this family? I can't. I don't remember. Okay. I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, but it was uh, one of the outstanding <coughs> things of our visit to Miami. Um, one of the unpleasant things that happened was that this politician somehow had found was what was supposed to be Adolf Hitler's yacht was a, a wreck. And, and uh, they wanted to blow it up in front of us. And we really did not like this particular part of our visit. Uh, and then he also arranged for a private yacht to take us to the spot where the St. Louis passed out to sea a little bit. And it was just as I remembered how close we were to the beach and to Collins Avenue and to the hotels. Of course, that now there are many more than there were then. But it was such a friendly scene that we saw as we passed by and were uh, followed by the military planes so many years ago. We had on board uh, some of this politician's uh, supporters as well, uh, but otherwise just the St. Louis survivors, none of their accompanying people were on board. We had, um, we had a rabbi and a, and a priest and a minister on board as well who all said prayers. And we threw flowers into the water for the people who didn't survive. And then afterwards, there were many parties and so on. We got the key to the city and all that sort of thing. And uh, we came away with good feelings. Uh, but 
but uh, to my uh, regret, we haven't been able to stay in touch much with each other. Um, uh, the next contact with St. Louis people was the one that was uh, in, in Skokie, Illinois, to make a documentary. Um, the one that I showed you the yeah. tape to. When was that? Um, I can't think of the name right now. It's it's over there. It it, it was nine of us got together, uh, and uh, some of us have been together in Miami. We made this documentary, and then uh, one more time, a documentary was made in 1993, and that was made by a Canadian film company uh, uh, for a television presentation. The producer was an Iranian Christian man. Uh, the the director rather the producer was a French Jew the cameraman was Dutch it was a very international crew and uh, there were I think again nine of us who were together uh, some of us had met before in Miami or in in Illinois some of us hadn't met before and we did a film on board a cruise ship to get the feeling of being on high seas and uh, that film is called The Voyage of the St. Louis and as a matter of fact has been shown in France, in Finland, in Canada, in Britain, in Ireland. It will be shown here on August 29th, 1996 on the Discovery Channel. And uh, that experience was a very interesting experience as well. At that time my daughter Joan accompanied me at the invitation of the uh, director. Do you have some statement that you would like to make in closing that to leave with your children with the world um, I think that everything really goes back to a few things the, the choices and the decisions of my parents as to our immigration uh, the kindness and generosity of the Blum family to bring us to this country and our good fortune of getting away with our lives by the skin of our teeth and I thank God for all of that. Thank you. Can you tell us who this gentleman is? That's my father, Joseph Joseph. The picture was taken before our immigration out of Germany. He looks very grim on that picture. But oddly enough, uh, my children have made a remark that on almost all the pictures that they've seen of my father, he doesn't smile. And I never realized that, but he sure smiled a lot for me. Can you tell us who this lady and child are? Uh, this is my mother with me. I'm three years old. My mother is 30 years old. I always felt that I had the most beautiful mommy of anybody. And looking at her on that picture, I can see why my father waited for her. He knew her when she was 11, but he didn't marry her until several years later. <laughs> That's my mother. At, uh, the small picture is also a picture that was taken for immigration identification. And she looks very serious on there. She's 38 years old and faces a very uncertain future. The larger picture was taken on our trip to Wright in 1989. My mother was 88 years old. And you can see she was radiant. She was alert. She was a lady. And she was full of life.
this is the house where I was raised and lived for the first 10 years of my life. And to me, it represented all that was good in my childhood and the security and safety that I felt in those first 10 years. It has been restored by the present owners. Oh, ho. Uh, this is a picture of the passenger committee of the St. Louis that was formed uh, when the captain decided he might need uh, some help in negotiating with uh, uh, whoever and also as a liaison group between himself and the passengers. From left to right in the background is Dr. Max Weiss. Uh, next to him is Mr. Herbert Ma Manassi, the gentleman who chose to go to France and the only member of the committee who perished when the Nazis invaded France. Next to him is uh, Dr. Hausdorff, uh, uh, who lived in the same house with us in London with his family. Next to him is Dr. Max Zellner. He was an attorney from, I uh, can't remember just exactly from where. He was an attorney, was there with his wife and his two daughters on board. And in front of these gentlemen, the chairman of the committee, Joseph Joseph, my father, who seems to be in a very good mood on this photograph. I believe it was taken when the committee was first formed because two other gentlemen joined uh, sometime after that, a Mr. Gutman from Berlin, a businessman, and a Dr. Wendig, a medical doctor, who uh, chose to go to Belgium and who did indeed survive and come to the United States. We're looking at my picture at age 10. It was taken for a German Jewish identification card. Uh, my hair is stuck behind my ear against my principles because Hitler said that all Jews had some recognizing mark on their left ear. This is pure legend and I really hate, hated that picture at the time. <laughs> This is a picture of the steamship St. Louis of the Hamburg America line. It was a luxury liner that mostly sailed between New York and Havana for pleasure cruises. This is a picture of Captain Gustav Schroeder, the captain of the St. Louis. He was most sympathetic to his Jewish passengers. <clears throat> um, he allowed Hitler's picture to be removed from the public rooms while Shabbat, Shabbat services were going on. And he is the only righteous Gentile honored by Yad Vashem who helped Jews before the war because all other righteous uh, Christians uh, were people who helped Jews during the war and we're hoping to have an official ceremony uh, for him uh, in the near future in Israel at Yad Vashem. Uh, that's a picture of me holding the roses that were sent to me by Mr. Troper uh, in response to my having apologized that the uh, flower shop uh, was empty uh, on the St. Louis after being at sea for 40 days. And it was my first uh, presentation of roses by a gentleman. This is a picture that presented itself as we entered the harbor of Havana, Cuba, and I was enchanted with the palm trees, the pastel houses that lined the, the uh, coast area, and the beautiful dome of the capital. This is my husband, Hans Loeb, whom I married at age 18, and 
husband stayed married for two weeks short of 40 years. He was one of the most noble characters I have ever met in my life. This is the wedding picture of my son Joel Loeb and his wife Sue Halsey. They are a very happily married couple and uh, it's a wonderful uh, remembrance of their wedding day. And there's one of the two of them together that's nice too. Okay. Let's see this one. This is the wedding picture of my daughter Joan and her husband Robert Michener. Uh, the wedding took place in our garden and was an especially memorable occasion because it was shared with our closest with ours and their closest friends. These are my children, Johnny and Joel. Uh, the occasion is our visit to Wright on invitation of, our, of my hometown. And this is a boat ride on the Rhine River. They both look pretty happy. And we all had a very lovely time together. This also is a picture of uh, the trip on the Rhine River, this time with my mother, my children, and myself. Uh, a trip on the Rhine on one of the beautiful tour boats is always a treat and I look forward to them. This is my oldest grandchild, my daughter Joan's son, Asha Loeb Reese Michener. Besides having such an auspicious name, he loves sports. Here he's with his baseball equipment and hockey and football and whatever else there is. He loves it all and he is a sunshine in my life. He's a what shall we do here? Uh, the, the, the one you hold in your hand is the most recent, mm -hmm. but uh, the yeah. others are also quite recent. They, they were done in, let just do the two of those as they are. Too bad we can't get the last one. These are two Washington grandchildren. They are Joel's and Sue's children. Uh, on the left is Benjamin Hans Loeb. He's a mischievous, sweet-natured, blonde uh, munchkin. And I enjoy their visits, his visits to me and my visits to him each time. On the right side is my granddaughter and our little princess. Her name is Lexis. She's named for my mother, Lily and uh, her, la her full name is Lexis Halsey Loeb. She is a very bright youngster of close to three years old and gets into all kinds of mischief. Unfortunately, uh, the fourth grandchild is on the way and at the present time we do not have pictures. This is Max Percal. He is chronologically an old friend and at the present time, my loving companion, we are able to enjoy our so-called golden years together by traveling together and enjoying each other's company and each other's families.